Welcome back, everybody, to Rob's Metalworks. What a special afternoon it is for everyone here at the program. Brings me great, great pleasure to welcome one of our own, one of the brightest ever to come out of San Antonio, our prodigal son in Mr. Dave McLean. Sir, you privilege me by being here in our studio this afternoon. You're way too kind. <laughs> <laughs> Much too kind. Thank you. Good to be here. Dave, it's been uh, many years since you've been on Rob's. We're looking at my wall here. I think I that that picture was from two... Uh, the blue beard back then. That was, uh, <laughs> that was the uh, Through the Ashes tour. And uh, we I think that was either the day before or the day after. we we'd, uh, Some guy in Austin won this contest and we played his... Uh, at his house. Oh so yeah, it, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. And we did the the backyard or the the we jammed in his garage. It was like us and the Devil Driver guys were there. It was, it was wow, awesome. wow. Yeah. So uh, nonetheless, glad to have you back. Definitely a very, I feel a pivotal point in the career of, of Dave McLean. And um, you know, I wanted to chat with you about it. That you know, as you and I know, at our tenure, uh, life is about changes, and, and changes always seem to happen. Um, when we least expect them. But uh, before we get started, you know, I said, you know, our prodigal son, obviously you have long roots uh, in this town, and every time you come to San Antonio, people want to hang out with you, family, friends. Um, so let's kind of start there. I mean, uh, a little while ago, we shot a promo for the uh, Return to the Metal Capital event, and for those people who were, were not be privy to attend um, at the end of June, let's, let's talk a little bit about your beginnings here in San Antonio. Obviously, you know, people know that uh, you were part of the first incarnation of uh, S.A. Slayer. And when you think about, back about uh, your time in S.A. Slayer, um, what do you think about? Do you think what do you think about yourself at that time? We, we were just uh like we were just these dudes that it was, me and Don Van Stavern, we had, we had been in a band together and we were, uh, you know, the, the metal scene was, for us was, was, uh, you know, there were, we had been in a band called Seance and we were, we would play stuff like, we would play cover songs and we had original songs and we were more into like the bands that we were playing were like Thin Lizzy, Riot, you know, Judas Priest stuff and everything else. And then, uh, when, Joe Anthony would play, you know, you know how like he would play these on his radio show and he like Iron Maiden just got us, man. And like we that whole new wave of British heavy metal stuff was that's what we wanted to do. You know, we were like, I don't know, 17 years old. Yeah. And that's and that that next that next level of heaviness for us was like, that's what we wanted to do. And um, so we found these other you know the the ad was put out in the paper I, you know like i said i can't remember if it was me or if it was art or bob uh but we we found like-minded people that were into this the new wave of british heavy metal stuff and um and started a band you know and and that's we wanted to be iron maiden that's what we wanted to be ah. yeah and uh and it was just it was killer man it was just a great time it was something that you know that wasn't really happening in San Antonio that was that was more of the older right. like the older stuff to us which um so we we just started doing this thing and it, and it caught on and um we you know caught the this guy Bob O'Neill who had the the recording studio boss boss studios and we went down there and he had like he had us we were doing we did the prepare to die EP there um or like he used to have like the butthole surfers were coming in like watchtower like you know he had all these he just sought out these you know saw all these people playing in san antonio mm -hmm. and it was like this cool little scene you know and and so it was it was a crazy time we were talking off camera and you know we we're talking about our age and, it, and i was telling you i said man you were you were kind of bright at the perfect age uh, at that time, not just to be a fan and a spectator of, of the new wave of British heavy metal, but really to kind of go out there and start doing music and yeah. creating a scene. Yeah. Well, it was it was it was the perfect age because well, it was the perfect age for the for what we did with Slayer because you know we had um, if we would have all been like a couple of years older, you know, we still would have been in that that kind of like. It just that different, uh, uh, you know, still like yeah. the Thin Lizzy, Judas Priest right. stuff, which we were like, I'm not dissing it at all because it's right. still in my blood. But to 
for when all that stuff came out, like, you know, Accept and, and Saxon and, and Iron Maiden, Angel Witch, all that stuff, like, that was, we were in the perfect gap to, to start doing that, right. so... Yeah, and it was just, you know, it was just cool back in, it's like San Antonio back then, and even before that whole thing started, like, Joe Anthony really created, like, he really was like the godfather of, of, of San Antonio, you know, like, he, uh, he create he, he brought all these bands, you know, he brought all these amazing bands, like, and the, you know, from what I remember, it was bands like, you know, Rush, Pat Travers, bands like that would come mm -hmm. through, and, and, you know, and they were obviously like getting big everywhere, but I think San Antonio for them back back then was like maybe that kind of elevated them into like you know the Joe Freeman Coliseum mm -hmm. or the the Hemisphere Arena or whatever. And you know, he had his pizza place. I think was it called? God, I can't remember what it was called, but he had his pizza place. He used to have all the bands in, and and uh, you know, he created the the whole the whole rock and roll the. San Antonio is the rock and roll capital of the yeah. world, you know? Yeah. You know, um, it's easy to look, kind of look back and say, oh, man, all these great players came out of that time. You know, Dave McLean and, and Bobby Jarzombic and Ron Jarzombic and McMasters. And were, were you, were you drum-wise, were you already, did you feel like, you know, hey, I'm, I'm a pretty good drummer. I'm, how, how, were you, how did you kind of develop your drumming to kind of really become one of, one of the best out of our city? Man, uh, well, thanks for saying that, but there was, you know, Bobby Jarzon, the Jarzombek brothers were, yeah, I mean, when we, you know, from when I was young, like, I had, I think I had chops or whatever, so I had, I had something going on, and I, and I think back then when I had hair, I was at least a little bit cute, so I was <laughs> probably like a decent, a decent addition to a band, you know. I had the Def Leppard look, you know, and I had the... Don't make me pull out the vinyl. Then I had the, then I had the Iron Maiden look, you know. We, I could do all, all the looks back then with, with my hair. But, um, yeah, it was just, <clears throat> you know, lucky, lucky to be around great players, too. Like, all the dudes in S.A. Slayer were great. And, and, you know, when we got Ronnie into the band, we used to practice out at... Ronnie Jarzombek. Yeah. We, used to, we started practicing out at, at uh, his, the family house, you know, his mm. family house. And... And we'd practice in his living room, and then Bobby, Bobby had like a little shed in the back. They kind of lived out. They had quite like quite a bit of land out there, I think, from what I remember. And it was kind of out in the country-ish, you know. And um, so Bobby would be out in his shed just playing drums, and and they were he and he and Ronnie were they're light years ahead of any most musicians that I know, you know, the way they were back then when they yeah. were like 17, 18 years old. They're still light years ahead of any upset. anywhere where I'm at so like I would hear Bobby playing his drums back there and and uh like one I'm lucky they just didn't kick me out of the band and get Bobby you know and just then and then just then I would have just had to get a regular job and my life would have changed but um but you know it, like Bobby I would listen to Bobby and he would be doing these things that I, I really never heard anybody doing on drums and he would you know he would show me the basic ideas of what he was doing mm -hmm. and and like it, it was amazing, and then Ronnie's Ronnie's writing. I remember it took, Ronnie wrote this uh, this intro to this song off Go for the Throat called "Ancient Swords," and it was about a like a fifteen second intro to the song. And it, I think it took us like about a month of practices to wow. to learn it because it was just so like crazy to us, you know. And um, so it was yeah, it was nuts. Like growing up, and then like. You know the Watchtower guys. Like we would play shows with them, and those dudes were like, they're insane too. They're they're kind of like in that realm of. I mean, that's why that's why Bobby and Ronnie and those guys got together and were doing their things because they were on another planet. So mm -hmm. they were just doing that thing. So um, yeah, it was it was cool stuff to be around. You know, um, even you know we're talking. You know several decades later you know people in this city still kind of celebrate that era yeah. and when i think about that time and as i was sharing with you you know i was just a teenager uh you know enjoying it but it i think one of the things that people also loved about that time is that there just seemed to be this cohesiveness within the scene it was just like the metal scene and and you know as complex as our lives have gotten since then now it's it the scene is so divisive there's so many subgenres of metal and right. things like that what what did you enjoy about that cohesiveness or brotherhood uh, 
I, I don't know where what you know. That's great that you have that that uh, that perception and that idea of of love. You know. Yeah. But back then, it was, was it competitive? Then hell yeah, it was. I mean, besides like Watchtower, like we respected them and we we you know we would do play shows with them and and Jason McMaster was like at one time at when uh, at one time we were kind of thinking that we might. He might be the singer for S.A. Slayer when, oh. when after things were going kind of, you know, with Steve and everything, um, and so we were thinking about him. But all the bands in San Antonio, like there was no love. Like we <laughs> we knew we knew we were the best band in San Antonio, yeah. and we were doing it. And we were, yeah. you know, like our shows. Like we would have these shows at like Via Fontana yeah. that were like selling out. Like you know, we we were we were definitely like legends in our own minds and. But you know, it was killer. Like we were doing really good in San Antonio, and all the all the bands around us, we we were like, "Fuck them," <laughs> you know. I'm sure it's all cool now. I'm sure it's all yeah. nice now. You know everything. But you know, it was competitive back yeah. then, and we were, you know, we were we we wanted we weren't just looking at San Antonio. Like we wanted to we wanted to be like I said, we wanted to be Iron Maiden. We sure. we had these grand things, and you know, obviously that. You know, one thing after another happened, and, yeah. and you know, the main thing that probably that brought down the band was me and Don started. Um, we met Mark Reale from right. Riot, right. so that was. And was uh, that the formation of Narita? Well, at the time, like we we had this uh, so we had this friend named Ricky Warheit, and um, yep. and he. We, me and Don were kind of living at his house when we were yeah. like probably 17, 18 years old and um with him with he and his mom and and ricky like back then it was uh i don't know how he i don't know how he got into it but back then like he became like uh like bands managers would send you know like i remember him getting like the crocus headhunter record like the the test pressing of right. it to, to bring to the radio station like they would they would use people in other towns as for I don't know what like pr promotion yeah. yeah yeah and um, so uh, he had he knew Mark Reale from doing all that from being uh -huh. like it was kind of like it was kind of like street team thing yeah. but it wasn't a street team back then it was just like a guy you know yeah. and and, um, and so he knew Mark and and uh, he introduced us to Mark and Mark loved San Antonio because because of the yeah. whole Joe Anthony yeah. like the rock capital thing so and he just loved Texas you know he was from New York but he loved it down here and. And we uh, we hooked up with him, and we just started like we started jamming with him. Mainly, mainly he was uh, we met him on the Restless Breed tour, and um, then he he was writing songs for the next record, Born in America. And so we just basically started like he was using us as his band, like demo yeah. band, you know, studio yeah. guys. And um, you and we, Donnie. Yeah, me and Donnie, and and Steve Steve Cooper too, oh. and uh, Steve was singing on it. And so we did. Pretty much all the demos for Born in America, you know, like, and he, so we we recorded him at at, uh, at at Boss at Bob O'Neill Sound Studio, and then we flew up to. He invited us to go to New York for their rehearsals, and and he like, remember him giving them the cassette, you know, like, here's the songs these, you know, I recorded with these guys, and I remember it was, it was a little tense, you know, it was like. I remember like seeing like Sandy Slavin looking at me like, like I gotta I'm gonna listen to what this punk just played, you know, and like mm -hmm. I'm gonna listen that's as my guide, and um, so it was cool, you know. And from there, I think I think the riot thing was I don't whatever was going on in Riot World was wasn't great, and so Mark was looking to do something else. So yeah, me me Don and Steve were doing that, and that's how the the Narita thing came wow, along. Cool. And the, and you know we and we just we saw that as like. We saw that as this could be our this could be our thing, our way our way to do something sure. better, you know, and and it uh, and it and it made the the San Antonio the Slayer thing. Mm -hmm. I keep saying San Antonio Slayer, but it, it, you know, yeah. at the time it was the, the Slayer thing, just kind of uh, kind of go to the wayside, you know, and that's and then that was like the the, the infamous Slayer versus Slayer show sure. at Via Fontana, you know, yeah, and um, that was pretty much the last. Our last hurrah, I guess, you know.
One of, the, one of the things that I've kind of always applauded you for and, and respected you for is that you were one of these guys who, I guess, at that time had kind of decided, you know, I want to be a musician, I want to do music. And, and you packed your bags and went to California. And, and, you know, a lot of people don't want to do that or they're afraid to do that. Um, you went out to California. I think a lot of people don't realize that. And they just kind of remember your next step being in, in Arizona with Sacred Reich. But you were in California for a little bit before you went to Arizona. Yeah, yeah. Like, I had, um, you know, yeah, I mean, the music was all, like, that was all I had, you know? Like, the growing, like, my my family pretty much, like, I was uh, being with Don. Like, Don's Don Van Staveren's family, they kind of took me in when I was, you know, 15 you know like my family just kind of dissolved everybody kind of went their separate ways and and uh so his family kind of took me in and so playing in bands was that was all I had like that was that was it and then we you know from living at his place we lived at like Ricky's house we had you know we had all like we had houses by our we had a house with even back in the seance days like me Don and and Bill Lopez a singer from seance like we all lived in a house, you know, and we were like, fuck, I was probably, you know, 14 or 15 or something, you know. And so um, moving out to, after the after the thing with Mark, the Narita thing was going on, and, and Don and Mark were kind of the, another phase of Riot was starting to, to sure. come up again. And so one of the singers that we had, we had checked out for Narita was Neil Turbin from Anthrax. Yeah. And, and I kept talking to him. And so he he was putting a band together, and so that was kind of like a thing for me to get out to L.A., uh, you know, and, and um, I went out there, and it, it was, you know, it it's just one of those stepping things. It, it was, like, for me, the music and everything, it was a little more, you know, it was pretty commercially kind of more like White Snake or, yeah. you know, Doc and stuff or whatever, and it wasn't, it, it didn't last long, but it got me out there, and it got me... You know, like he was cool. He hooked me up with a, a job at like a telemarketing place first day there, and yeah. got me a you know living in a studio apartment with this dude, and and then um, you know I met my who's still like my best friend Ross Robinson, and he he and the guitar player for Turban went to MI together, and um, so they were they had a Ross had an apartment they were living there. I met Ross and. You know, from there, like we started playing in band shortly after his his band yeah. broke up, and and uh, yeah, five years later, the Sacred Reich thing happened, and it was my first break. You yeah. know, finally started finally started doing it. We're gonna end out this conversation uh, discussing Sacred Reich, uh, but before we we get there, you know, we have to talk a little bit about uh, obviously your long tenure in Machine Head. Yeah. Um, a 23 year career uh, with a band and really I kind of feel like that was that was really like the, the launching pad for, for Dave McLean obviously you did a lot of successful things you did eight records with the band um, toured all over the world you know um, made millions of, of fans across the world uh, when when the call uh, for Machine Head uh, happened were you already kind of familiar with <laughs> with Flynn and, and, and Logan Mater and those guys that you know them at all? Did you know anything about violence or anything like that? I knew about violence, yeah. yeah. Like me me and Ross Robinson, we were at uh, on the, they were opening for Testament on the New Order tour. And so we saw, we were at the show at the, at the True Door and we saw violence, you know, two or three times around, yeah. like back in the day, like Eternal Nightmare tour and stuff. So, um, so I knew of that, like, and, uh, but honestly, like, w the thing about Machine Head was I didn't know any of the songs. Like, I had heard one song on, like, the local metal show on, on uh, KUPD in Phoenix. And um, and I, I, I was like, I, don't, I didn't really, I'm not saying that I didn't like it because it was bad. I just didn't, it didn't really, like, hit me. I was yeah. like, okay, that's cool, whatever. The thing that hit me was, uh, you know, when I, I got in, I got put in touch with with Rob, and we they were out on the road. And the thing that got me was the uh, the determination of the band and, and where they were where they were headed, and, and the things that were they were doing were, you know, what 
what I needed and what uh, that was like I, I'm gonna jump on this thing because this thing is going and they had a record deal they were doing things like dynamo they were doing kind of big things yeah, I mean the the record I, I I didn't really know a whole lot about what they were doing I mean when I was talking to them they were on you know the tour that they were on was like the last headline thing that they were doing and it was it was bleak at best you know like when I would talk to Robbie he's like oh yeah we're fucking playing this place we're fucking pool tables for stage whatever you know it was yeah. just like but but it was it, it was it was going and and uh and they had they had momentum and and they were driven and that's yeah. that's that's the thing that got me and that was and uh, that's what I wanted to do and it was you know the the music was cool I just wasn't it hadn't like it wasn't in my blood the stuff that they were doing and then um like when I went out and did the audition and everything and uh and uh, they played me couple they taught me a couple riffs that they were working on and and it was cool it was more thrashy stuff it was really mm -hmm. you know hardcore stuff so yeah it was it was badass so it was you know something i wanted to, to get onto and you know of course like the next the through the or the uh more things change record was the first record i did yep. with them that was like i fucking love that it's still my one of my favorite my favorite phone. machine head records you know um, that was going to be my next question. I said, of all the eight records that you recorded on, uh, which one was your favorite? Yeah, I mean that one, probably that one for sure. And uh, um, I just love some, the, just I can still listen to it, and it's like killer, you yeah. know. And and um, and then probably like through the ashes because that that record oh. for me was like writing wise, like writing like riffs on guitar and stuff for me. That was you know that was a time when like Aru Aru had left the band and. And it was just me, me, Adam, and Rob, and and so I kind of I was like, okay, well, he's you know, Rob had Logan, Rob had Rue as like the the second writers, mm -hmm. and that was gone. So I just started, I remember just writing everything that I could, and I, wow. all these things I was coming up with, like you know, riffs for Imperium for you know, Vim for to send the shades of night, like nice. all these all these things were just coming out and I would I'd just give everything I I had to Rob and whatever was used was cool, you know? Wow. Yeah. I so didn't know that. Yeah, so that was like and it was it's just it was a cool record for the band because it got us it got us back back into the metal scene again because yeah. from Supercharger till then was a real pretty pretty bleak period, you know. We kinda we, I mean, we made a DVD about it on on the record, and yeah. and uh, and it was just a, a very bleak time for the band. Like we didn't know if we were gonna be a band anymore. With the you know the label dropping us and all right. that stuff. So yeah, it was definitely that comeback. That was that was easily one of the most rewarding rewarding things that musically that's that's happened with me. You know, it kind of seemed that to me as a fan. Like I always thought the Burning Red was kind of like the 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 odd, the odd man out as far as the records. I knew it was a really kind of weird time uh, in music, and uh, I still love that record, even though you know Rob was doing some rapping and the look was a little different. But you know, I kind of felt like after Supercharger, the the Machine Head really started getting heavy again and focusing on just being like this brutal metal band again. Yeah, I mean it, it was, and and yeah, the Burning Red was a departure. I think. Uh, I mean, there were a few things like that was the first record without Colin Richardson, so that yeah. that that was a huge part, and um, that was the record we did with Ross. And I just I think the main thing was that we just we just looked like a bunch of jackasses. I remember you had the polka dot hair. Well, that was cool. I loved yeah, that. That was, that, cool. that, that, was, that was awesome. I mean, I had that. I had that even on the More Things Change tour, yeah. but the the clothes um, the, more like the clothes we were wearing and the and the the direction that we were going as far as like videos and everything was like, you know. And it's, you know, it's not talking shit because we've all just said it. Our, everybody in the band at that time, it was fucking stupid. You know, we yeah. that would that would to me that that was the biggest thing was just the look, you know, and because um, I mean the record to me is super dark and super heavy. Yeah, I, I love the record, um, but yeah, after that, you know, obviously, like if you look at the way we looked on on Supercharger, it was a it was a we're rejecting we're rejecting the way we looked on the burning red and we're right. going back to just wearing regular clothes right. and everything being you know kind of i think at the time we felt like we were getting back to uh you know it was it was tough it was always tough up until 
you know, through the ashes and the blackening because the we were always trying to live up to burn my eyes. You know what I mean? Like it was always like that record was such a big thing for people that it, it, it um, nothing we ever did even lived up to to you know the the hype of that. You yeah. know, and um, so it was a, it was a tough it was like trying to get back to that to right. that thing. You know, and, and Supercharger was didn't quite do it, and then. And then I think that's why through the ashes was so so cool because it did it we it broke everything it broke us all down right. you know like we were we were doing things that we were we were on the point of uh, on the path of like we were writing these commercial like for that we were we were trying everything we could to get signed and so we were almost selling our soul to just get a record deal you know mm -hmm. and we were just we had this these hopes like oh yeah david you know david draymond has a, his own label like oh my god please give us a record it was almost where we were like begging you know what i mean and then and then it it got to a point i just told the guys i'm like look man like we're gonna if this is it let's fuck let's not write these let's not do these like pop like commercially songs let's mm -hmm. Let's go out fighting. Like, let's be a metal band again. And if this is the last thing we ever do, then so be it. But let's go out and and at least like let it be respected. You know right. what I mean? So it was it was a long process of just getting to that point, and, and then you know writing writing the songs for that record, and, and you know it was great. And getting Phil Phil Demmel in the band, and mm -hmm. towards the, like the tail end of that record, uh, and you know it was. It was awesome. It was, a, you know, it was a rebuilding period, and yeah. we and we busted our asses. Like we we did the longest tour in Europe that we'd ever done. Like we were there for like three months, you know. And we were just trying to get back into, you know, we were trying to survive basically. And that and that, luckily that record connected with a lot of people. And then obviously, you know, go, out of that going into the blackening, and that record, that was that record was was definitely the time when, okay, the Burn My Eyes thing is finally just, it's, people aren't really talking about that anymore because the blackening is this thing that like really connected with people, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, um, and it gave us this, this whole, another, another fan base, you know, and, and I think the people who were into the stuff before were really into it too, so it was one of those magical records that, that, uh, it was amazing, and and the whole tour, like the tour cycle, went three years. You know, the last year was us just touring with Metallica for two weeks on, two weeks off. You know, yeah. for that whole time, and and uh, so it added added to the kick assness of the, of that that record. So that's my favorite record. Uh, one of them. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm I love all of them, but I think that one's my favorite, and I listen to that one the most. You know, um, so you know, as we talked um, earlier, you know, things always change in life, and obviously, you know, um, your your time in Machine Head is now a, a part of your past. I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You your time with the band ended officially in, uh, at the end of the last Catharsis tour, which is like in the November 2018. Now. Yeah. Um, so it's been a little while and, you know, before we move on, um, when you look back, uh, at your time at Machine Head, what, what do you, what do you think will be your fondest memory of that time? Uh, man, I mean, I mean, some of the, pff, there were, you know, there were some killer times, like, you know, it's about like in the beginning, like, you know, first tours we did, like OzFest 97 was amazing, just um, you know, we got to tour with some killer bands back then, like doing stuff with Pantera. We did, you know, like, um, you know, like I said, like getting, getting into it. There's so many, there's so many peaks and, ba and valleys and in, in being in a band. And, you know, I think like learning how to, learning how to ride those waves and kind of absorb the things when you're, when things are bad and then mm -hmm. things go back up, you know, like, like I was saying, like through the ashes was one of the most rewarding times because you because you did just go through this whole thing of where you know like I mean we were we were pretty much like after supercharger up in in and while we were doing that like we were we were broke you know like we were back to like shit man like do is this is it over you know and then and then having everything go back up and the, and and it was 
it's rewarding, yeah. you know, and it and it's it's cool and yeah. and uh and it, and it it's just sad, you know, it makes it's just a good feeling. So yeah. um so yeah, those th- there's a lot of those things like that, you know, and then unfortunately it gets to a point where it it did and to the whole last year where I was uh um you know, I remember just telling my telling my wife like I'm, the, I'm there's no love for this you know like I don't I don't believe in in what we're doing like I don't believe in the the songs we're doing I don't believe in the direction and like and it's and it's hard because I, I have them you know I have my wife I have our dog I have them to think about because sure. it's their life too so sure. so me me leaving my what I'm doing and and my like financially you know it's it's a it's a hard thing to get to where you're where you have to make that decision and like what's 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 better for you and and I knew the answer to that and I knew being happy is was the was the answer and so it was just a hard time it's a hard time getting to that point you know because you have to you know it that's a lot of things it and things were things were happening to like anxiety. I was having like anxiety. I was having all these things, and it's and it's crazy going through all this stuff because we were in we were in Japan. It was like one of the last you know the last time we were with Japan. We did Japan, Australia, and I was having anxiety about it so bad that at one point I I, I felt like I was having like a fucking heart attack. Man, mm-hmm. I was walking. I've run like five six seven miles every other day and i'm walking up these stairs in in, in um in shibuya in tokyo and I'm like i can't breathe i'm like i had to hold on to the rail i'm like and it was all these emotions like going going through my body like knowing i i know it's over you know i know i know my time in machine head is over and and it's scary scary as the fun. uncertainty of it yeah. yeah, it's scary as fuck, and and then you gotta, you know, you and you gotta go through every and everybody go and, and everybody goes through it, and that's one of the comforting things about going through something like that is yeah. you know, you know, I, a lot of times it seems like it's just you, but it's it's millions of people going through this yeah. thing, and and you know, and and it's hard, and when you get through it, I'm happy, I'm I'm out, I'm playing with Sacred Reich, we we're. People think we're, I don't even, a lot of people don't even, A, they might not even <laughs> ever ever even heard of Sacred Reich. B, like people, we're trying to get back on, we're playing shows to like, you know, sometimes we're playing shows like 50 people, but I'm so fucking happy. I'm playing the music, I'm, I love the music, I love everything about it, and, and that's the main thing, like yeah. that, you know, everything else, everything will fall into place, yeah. you know, and, um, and it, it, and I'm sure a lot of people out there, their perception, like, what do you, you left Machine Head for? What are you doing? You're playing 20 people. I'm like, I know, it's amazing, it's fucking amazing. It was a long road to get to the, to this happy, you you're know. Full, you're full circle now, kind of. Yeah, and yeah. It, and it, and it's, you know, it's like, and that's what it's all about. And and we're gonna we're trying, you know, we're gonna we're trying to make this happen. We got a great record, we've got you know that we believe in and we're and and we're just four dudes that are having a great time out on the road and and just enjoying being together again you know so first of all uh david i want to say thank you for sharing uh some of your feelings and details on that um and uh secondly you know i think that's why people kind of love you is because you know you for you to make the decisions that you've made uh, speaks to who you are and speaks to the integrity of the person that you are. And, you know, you don't see a lot of that in our world today. Um, so, and, and I think you made the right decision, even though uh, I know how difficult it can be. Okay, so now let's talk about the here and now in 2019 and beyond, because now, of course, as you mentioned, you're back with your buddies in Sacred Reich out of Phoenix. Uh, how did the reunion with Sacred Reich happen? Because I know, um, like, if you would cross paths with them, you might go up and play a tune or yeah. a tune with them from Heal or Independent or something like that. Yeah, I mean, we we always, uh, me and Phil especially, 
uh, we we'd kept in touch over over the years, you know, all the time, and um, and uh, you know, once they started playing shows and everything, like there were there were times like we did Hellfest one time. I got off stage and they were playing yeah. right, right after I got you know jam with them, and you know, I was just always trying to. As a fan, I remained a fan. Like I'm still a fan. I'm in a band and I'm a, I'm still a fan. So cool. I was always just trying to get Phil to to do to do new stuff to the point of like writing a couple songs and like hey I got a couple songs for you if you want to put some vocals on it you know and uh, <laughs> and he he just wasn't feeling it until you know he started sending me um, uh, you know and he had a long process of stuff that he had to go through too and he had to realize that sure. that the re Maybe the reason he wasn't a part of him wasn't wasn't as happy as he could have been was because he wasn't doing music, you know. And I think he was trying to reject that and push it down for a long time. So um, we, uh, you know, he started a few years ago. He he called me one day and he just said, "Hey, you know, Greg's out of the band and uh, we're looking for a drummer." And I just instantly said, "I want to do it." I said, and he's like, "What?" And I said, "Well, in a perfect world for me, yeah. I would still do Machine Head, and and I would love to record a record with you guys and play some shows. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what would happen, but I know I'm still a fan of you guys, and I I still love I love Sacred Reich. So, you know, I think it was kind of apparent that 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 wasn't really going to be a possibility. And um, but he, while he was he started writing songs, and he was sending me sending me demos of the songs, and it was just giving me this like like oh man I'm so excited for you this this record's gonna be so good you know you're writing you're writing such great songs and you know true to sacred reich and everything right. and so you know one thing after another happened so <laughs> the stars aligned and they, now they look did. what's happening um so so you had had you been doing some rehearsing uh with with riley and phil before before your departure from machine head uh no it was uh um, we were just like, yeah, there was just the demos, like, you know, I'd have all. I'd but before you left, you, you knew, I'm, I'm going to go back to Sacred Reich, or did you still have options open? And uh, I didn't really have anything going on, like, towards, towards the end, yeah, I mean, that was, like, the thing, I was like, okay, I'm going to do this, like, that's, yeah. that's what I'm going to do. Okay. And, um, I never let it be the, the reason for, sure. I didn't want it to be. You know, I don't, I don't want to just for that to be the reason like, oh, yeah, I'm out of here. And, and uh, you know, that whole process of coming to that point, like I was just explaining, was was, you know, I, I wanted to, I needed to go through that and figure it out. And and then, um, you know, yeah. And then having being having the opportunity to go and and, and do that, do the record with them, because I knew they were they wanted to go record pretty soon. So, yeah. you know, that was and then, you know. One thing after another happened, man, and we're like, you know, the record's great, and we're, you know, like we're we're wanting to put in the work to to kind of get back on the map, you know, and do the things. Yeah, you you guys started working really fast. Um, I remember back in April, I got the the seven inch split, uh, Sacred Right, Iron Reagan, uh, out on Metal Blade Records, and I was like, holy crap, they are releasing recorded music with McLean on it, so it was cool. Um, the track was uh, "Don't Do It, Donnie." Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about that track for those people who haven't heard it. Yeah, it was just uh, it was a song that um, uh, you know that that had been a plan for a while to do something with with uh, with Iron Reagan, like the split thing, and um, and it was it was you know we we uh, it was the first day that we went in to record for the Awakening album, and it was just it was just its own thing. It was like a punk punk rock yeah. song it's everything about it is just lo-fi and it's just like it's a it's a minute and 52 seconds long and i think it it probably took us about you know we just a couple takes each of, of doing our parts and everything and and uh it's just a fun song and something that you know that we just wanted it to be like this quick punk rock you know keeping it real kind of sound or whatever and um and uh, completely different from we wanted it to be completely different from what the what the Awakening album is right. as far as like sonically and everything yeah. you know because we we had our own ideas about what we wanted that that to be you know so 
And, and the, uh, as you mentioned, the Awakening record, the brand new record from Sacred Reich. Correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, hopefully it's going to be out this summer. Is that true? Yeah, August 23rd, 24th. Yeah, that's coming out then. On, on Metal Blade Records, everyone. Metal Blade, back on, yeah, yeah. Back, to, back to Metal Blade. So, yeah. 23 years in the making. Yes, we had, it was awesome, man. We had, uh, we had this guy, Arthur Rizik, come in to produce it, and, and we, we had met, uh, Phil had met him. He had done, like, some stuff with Power Trip, Code Orange, and um, Cavalera Conspiracy, and, and uh, you know, once we started hanging out, he's, like, you know, he's, like, 32 years old, and, and um, we, uh, me and him just started, we started, uh, we had a house rented in Phoenix for the, you know, for where we were going to stay, me and him, to while we were recording, and we started drinking wine one night and like listening to music. And he's, he's like an old music soul, man. He like he knows so much about. Oh really? Yeah, because at one point we were talking about, you know, producers and what we wanted to do, and, and Phil had, you know, I was like, Phil, I was like, does he even know like, you know, like the old Maiden, like, yeah. you know, Black Sabbath, stuff, like Martin Birch production stuff, and and he was like, oh, Martin Birch, that's like one of my favorite wow. dudes. So. And he would he would reference all these things even when we're recording, you know. Hey man, you know, like on Sin the Sin After Sin record, you know that Phil that Simon Phillips did, and like, yeah, I know that, you know. So he, would, it was cool, you know. So we um, going into the record, we wanted to do something that like, you know, sonically was something in metal now that is kind of is kind of not really happening where it's everything everything's real, you know. All that you go in and you actually. You know the drum sounds are all real for for better or for worse. You know it, it, it's just real sounds that you're hearing, and um, so that's what we wanted to do. We wanted we were looking at things like, you know, the Mob Rules and you know Number of the Beast, like that. Those kind of those kind of records where, when you're listening to it, like you feel like you're kind of in the room mm -hmm. with the band hearing it. So um, yeah, it was it was a great process. It was you know it went quick and it was just really. Um, it was a great atmosphere to be in, you know. It's just fun, and, and and it was exactly I think every what is what everybody needed in the band. Everybody was looking for, you know, everything that I was looking for as far as like the process and everything else. Doing, you know, having a great time recording and and feeling like this kind of brotherhood with everybody. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 And if anybody uh, should have been having those conversations with the producer, it was you. Obviously, like you have far more recording experience than, than Phil and Wiley and them. So obviously, you were able to kind of really provide input on that front. Yeah, I mean, because it'd been it'd been a long time <laughs> since they were in a studio. You know yeah. what I mean? So um, you know, when I had told Phil at first, I said, you know, I don't want any any like sound replacement on the drums and he said what's that and i said we're, we're off to a good <laughs> <Don't> start <worry. laughs> yeah i said we're off to a good start <laughs> so um talk a little bit obviously you know the the title the awakening the, the return uh, of sacred reich to the national scene the worldwide scene again uh can you share a little bit about maybe um some of the theme or just the overall theme for the awakening um yeah i mean awakening it you know says a lot i mean the the band's been gone for 20 23 something years you know it's at least like writing new music and everything and you know uh like phil phil is in a he's he's a very uh he's very into like the buddhist buddhist ways mm -hmm. and 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 so the record awakening is, is it's so positive it's just you know um just about music and about life and just just about about positivity you know mm -hmm. and and that's 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 pretty much like the whole the theme of the record it's it's kind of weird it's almost like it's it's too happy <laughs> it's too happy in the metal world you know but it's i think it's something that's needed and it, it's yeah and and uh and it's just an amazing record, and it's a short record. It's eight eight songs and thirty minutes. Long. I was about to ask you that. Yeah, I was I was, I was jamming so to a to Independent on YouTube, and somebody posted, "I love Sacred Reich, but the records are too short." Yeah, well, here we go again. Like, <laughs> hey, that's who you are. That's yeah, who you, are as a band. you know, and uh, 
Yeah, and it's awesome. It's I mean, for me, it's I think it's perfect. I mean, look at Rain and Blow. It was 28 minutes, you know what <laughs> exactly. I mean? Like, and, uh, exactly. So I think, like, attention span-wise, that's what that's the cool thing about us is, like, you know, when we do headline shows, our headline show is like an hour, and I think that's, that's perfect. Okay, Dave, so um, earlier in the year, I guess in support of the split, you guys – uh, did a run with Iron Reagan. Was that the first tour that you did with the yeah, Sacred Reich? That was just like, yeah, I mean, that was just, we did, we, that, that was on this tour. So we did like four or five shows leading oh, up to okay. that. Yeah. And then there was about, I think it was about like 10 shows with, with those guys, okay. maybe 10 shows. And, um, yeah, it was kind of to support that. It was like a little co-headline yeah, thing yeah. with those guys. And, and it was awesome, man. It was, the, they're, they're such a fun live <laughs> band, you know, it's really good shows. Um, so how, how does it feel to be back out on the stage, you know, uh, with Sacred Rank after all these years? It's like I never left. It's like I feel so at home playing this music, yeah. you know, and, and uh, having fun with the dudes. It's there. It's you know, the opposite. It's it's really just the opposite of, you know, and not that from from Machine Head life to this. It's, you know, where Sacred Rank's a band that has like no image where four pretty pretty uh ugly dudes and and when we get on stage we just we kind of just walk on stage and we're there and we start feeding back and we you know feel here we go let's do this you know it's yeah it is it's it's like really it's really organic and it's really fun and um it's it's just awesome jamming with the dudes like it's cool just hearing the reamplifiers in my face and and doing it so it's cool and i think it's also cool too i mean obviously this is a a, a, a something smaller for you, but yet, um, I, I would think that you know it's a beautiful thing for the fans who now have more access to you. They're like, "Oh, Dave McLean, we get to see and hang out with Dave McLean and and speak with him, and I get to do things like this," you know. Yeah. Um, and it's a little bit more grassroots. So, um, have you have you been meeting people out there and people coming after you wanting to talk to you? Fans? Yeah, I. I Right after, when we're done with the show, like, I I stay on stage. I just go to the front of the stage. I'll sit down on the stage and bring, you know, give somebody my set list. Yeah. And I sit there and talk to people and, like, hang out. And, um, yeah, it's cool, you know. I think it, it's it's just, it's just nice. Like, it's just nice being able to, not that I couldn't do that, but, like, I mean, we always hung out with people and everything. Yeah. But, you know, not like from my drum drum ride. You know, drum riser getting off and coming down and just hanging out and just, sure. you know hanging out with people and, and talking and everything. And it's it's just a it's just a different animal, you know. And it, it's and um, I'm just enjoying it. You yeah. know, I'm just enjoying. It. That's that's all I can say about it. So I'm just having a great time doing it. This run uh, will last like another week. I think it ends on June first. What does um, what do you guys have lined up for the rest of 2019? Yeah, so we've got uh, pretty much, we're going to have like a good chunk of, of June and July off. And then we'll, uh, August, we'll get into doing like the the, the uh, festivals over in Europe. We'll do that. Right then, when the record comes out. Yeah. And then we'll do, uh, um, we're doing like the mega cruise. We're, cool. we're, we're, yeah, we're trying to, we're trying to, we're trying to feel it out and see like for uh, September, October or something, another, maybe another thing in the States if it. You know, um, you taking the wifey with you on the mega cruise? I th I think she I think she's in. We haven't really talked about it too <laughs> oh, much yet, but yeah, I'm I, surprised. I'd be like, I'm going with you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm. You know, I hope so. I hope she does. Um, but uh, yeah, we're just trying to figure it out and and get some stuff going. We you know, like I said, like getting back on getting back on the map sure. as far as everything goes. Like, you know, there's probably not a ton of bands out there who want to take us on tour because they don't know what we're gonna what we're gonna draw or we're gonna, right. what we're gonna bring but um you know we're so we may have to do another headline thing and you know hopefully the record is well received and people will will dig it and and get back out there and, and doing things so um and then we're going back we'll be in europe to finish out the year we're doing a, head, a headline thing there and we got some really cool stuff coming up in in the new year like February. Well, we'll be able to announce it pretty soon, but yeah. it's it's going to be something pretty pretty badass. Cool. Yeah. 
Well, you guys will be busy, and obviously I think that uh, once the record comes out that um, you will see um, greater momentum for Sacred Reich. Obviously, you just being back in the band has given them a, a jolt in the arm. Uh, yeah, we were it's taking us from 40 people to 50 <laughs> people a night. <laughs> so, Dave, uh, will we see any video work in support of uh, Awakening? You will. All right. Yeah, we just did. Uh, we went down before the start of this tour. We went down to uh, out to L.A., and um, our... Uh, our old buddy Mark Pellington, who did the independent video, who's done like his, just look up his his whole thing. He's done like, I mean, video wise, he's done, you know, like Alice James Rooster. He's done like everything, you know, yeah. Pearl Jam Jeremy and movies, wow. everything. So Phil, Phil sent him the record and we basically, he picked the two songs that he, that jumped out at him and, uh, One's called Something to Believe, and one's called Manifest Reality. And uh, so we got out there to do the videos. We were doing two in one day, which is kind of unheard of, right? And then, so he, he was asking, like, what's what's going on with the record? Like, what's first track going to be? We told him title track, Awakening. We didn't really have anything going on other than maybe a lyric video for it. And he said, no, no, let's, let's do it. Let's do another video. So, um, uh we did it like wow. yeah we we went out and just performance video yeah, yeah. of it you know nice. and but the way he shoots everything all black and white it looks so cool he makes us look cool so yeah. that's you know if cool. you can do that you're like you're doing something well those will those come out before the record or we've you know? got a whole plan I, I i've got it in my email it's gonna <laughs> something's gonna happen next There's month with a song there is a strategy okay, going cool, on but cool. yeah i think i think the video for awakening will come out next next month cool yeah june I'm, I'm going to say June 18th, but I, I, I could be wrong. Okay. Yeah. Well, Dave, uh, you know, as we get uh, near the end of this interview, first of all, you know, thank you so much for sharing everything. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about you, too. I mean, you know, when I, th when I think about uh, Dave McLean, you know, and your long career already, I mean, coming from, from like you said, you know, really from kind of a, a, a family that was broken up and... and taking risks and staying with people and and obviously you know without uh, a lot of those trials and tribulations to be and become where you're at now um and really kind of identifying with what's important in life um as a person and a human being you know you tell me rob i, I take care of my body too we were talking about your diet and, and, and being vegan and all that and that's that's a beautiful thing um when you when you think about your career did you think that when you started at 17, 16, that you'd still be playing drums now? I had no idea. I had, you know, back then, like my, you know, I kind of got pushed into it by, by Don Van Stavern. You know, he was always, he was a dude who was always like, had the attitude, had the thing going on, he was, you know, and, and uh, he would push me into doing things. So um, my whole thing was, uh, I just wanted to, my, my main guy back then was Tommy Aldridge. And, you know, ah. seeing him go from, like, you know, Black Oak, Arkansas, Pat Travers, you know, like Ozzy, seeing him play with Ozzy. And, and just do it. Why, every, you know, everything. Like, Isn't he, he like 70 something years old and still playing drums? Yeah, he's badass. Like, I, I've, I, got, to, uh, I got to hang out with him a little bit. Like, wow. he's, we're both Yamaha guys. So, my, ah. my, um, my Yamaha guy, uh, Greg Crane, he, we were at NAM and, and he goes, hey, we're doing a, we're doing a like a private dinner for Tommy, and I'd love for you to come. And I got to like ride in, in the limo with Tommy, and he would he would always sit me and Tommy together at the signing. So, you know, I got to talk to him, and he's just you know riding riding in the car with him to the dinner and having dinner with him and everything. And and he's just like, I said, don't tell him I've got a tattoo of him on my leg, because <laughs> you know. And it was just cool talking to him about about everything. He's such a he's such a humble dude. And is that true? What? The tattoo? I, yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I've got. I've got. I've got. I've got a, a leg of drum idols going. Oh, and, that'd be um, cool. Yeah, and 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 so it was just cool, like hanging out with him and, and just, yeah, he's just such a great dude and just, you know, makes fun of himself and he's just like super humble yeah. and and you know and back like back in the day like when like Tommy was my my dude you know and that was. 
that was my goal in life was just to I just wanted to play music like I you know he was band to band and I was like yeah just that's all I want you know and and uh, that's all I want to be able to do and I never I never looked I honestly never looked at being in a band as like a rock stardom or or the personality thing I, I never really I, I've always just felt like you know I've always just felt that I'm lucky to be here and that it could be anybody, you know, like I was t saying earlier, like Bobby Jarzombek was always like the dude, he could have just replaced me in, in S.A. Slayer, and there's always dudes who are better than you, who can do things better than you, who can do whatever, and you're, you're there, you're in this, you're in, you're, you know, you're lucky to be there, because we're all lucky to be there, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it's, that's kind of like, you know, it's kind of boring as far as like, <laughs> I want to hear like some rock star shit, but... I'm, no. just, I'm just happy to I'm just happy to still be here and do be playing music and and to you know when I meet people and they're like oh my god you're my favorite drummer that blows my mind because I've got all my favorite drummers on my leg yeah. and and um so to be when people tell me that it freaks me out you know and uh I'm very lucky to 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 have that so it's cool what would what would you tell obviously you know there's San Antonio because of our our history you know there's always young musicians and bands and and uh, you know drummers uh, out there. Uh, what would you tell them uh, uh, starting out? What would your best advice to them be? I always just tell them to to um, just love what you're doing and to like absorb as much as you can into playing because that's you know it depends on what you want. You know, if you it, for me like the joy of playing playing drums is is like the main thing you know right. what i mean so like getting into the as far as like getting into like the music business and all that stuff it's it's super hard you know it's the hardest thing to you know any anybody i know in a band knows it's 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 hard and and when you when things happen that are good you're you're lucky and it, it's all great but and then like all those peaks and valleys and and just um just enjoy playing basically you know just <laughs> that's it because that's all that's all it is like that's that's my main thing is like I still when I'm home I still play my drums like or even my practice pads like three four hours a day you know wow. and just, yeah wow. and just absorb and and like in the probably last like five six years I've become more of like like a student again and and, yeah. and re like reteaching myself reteaching myself how to play drums it's crazy you know, uh, we talked about longevity, and and uh, you know, who knows? You might be playing drums till you're 70 years old. All right. I'm not that far off. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this last and final question, Dave. Uh, whenever that time may be, you know, when it's all said and done for for Dave McLean, uh, what would you like? How would you like to be remembered, or what would you want the fans to remember about Dave McLean? I, to be honest, like if I'm to I just hope they I don't know I mean I don't know how I'm going to be remembered I, I you know everybody's always like oh you're like the most underrated drummer and I'm like am I because like there's so many great drummers I think maybe I'm where I need to be <laughs> like, I don't think you're underrated I, I, don't, I mean I think lots of people love Dave McClain but I don't know I mean I just you know I, I don't that's not really it I just hope they respect what I did you know yeah and uh whatever that is and 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 when they came to the show i hope you know i hope i put on a show for them yeah. and like entertain them at least and and was fun for them and that's i don't know i you know like i said like being being an inspiration to people like playing drums or playing music or whatever or that's that's cool for me so that's I don't, those are things I don't think about how I'm going to be remembered. <laughs> David, thank you so much. Thank you so much. God, what a great interview. Um, great chats. Our conversation, just like your recordings, will live on forever. Many fans out there will be able to enjoy them in the years to come. Remember everyone out there, our boy Dave McLean is back with Sacred Reich. They have a brand new record coming out in August called Awakened. Be sure to look for it out on Awakening out on Metal Blade Records. Uh, be sure to look for it when it comes out. You saw the man only right here on Rob's Metal Works. Your name will